All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Calm Council Alumni Career Series. Um, my name is Wendy um, McAnulty, and I'm a member of the Calm Council, and we are here to um, do our November edition of our career series. The series is hosted monthly by the Calm Alumni Council and features various alumni who share their career experience and answer your questions. You will learn about different career opportunities available from a Calm degree. And in this session, you'll hear directly from alumni about how they went from being a UCSB grad to their current job. Each session will feature a career spotlight with ample Q&A time. And today, this evening, we're delighted to feature Janelle Heim to speak about careers in strategy and marketing. Um, Janelle is a founder of Grayson Hayden Group, a strategic comms agency, and the former CXO comms expert at leading tech companies such as Cisco. Oh, I can't even pronounce this, Zillinex. <laughs> you have to mention uh, how you actually pronounce that. VMware and Cadence. She'll lead a discussion um, with our participants, and we look forward to hearing from you. So I'll turn it over to Janelle. Wonderful. Thank you, Wendy, and thank you to everyone on the comms council for welcoming me tonight. Uh, I'm going to go over a few things with you. I've sort of gotten some updates about what you might be interested in hearing about. And so the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, um, our agenda is going to be a little bit about life, a little bit about work, and a little bit about strategic marketing, and then I'll be more than happy to chat with you and take any questions that you may have. So the first part about life, I wanted to share with you a story about UC Santa Barbara. So I was absolutely thrilled to go to UCSB. I got down there for my first quarter, had a phenomenal first quarter. I was living in San Miguel. I came home at Christmas time, and I walked through a sliding glass door, and I cut every tendon and nerve in my left ankle and had to drop out of school. So I only made it through one quarter and then I had to stay home for surgery and physical therapy and all kinds of different things. Um, but I did make it back down for the final quarter from March to June and then realized that I needed to make up that time. And I had had a friend who was born and raised in Japan that I met at UCSB and she spoke Japanese and I could hear her talking to her family and I saw that she was reading Japanese and I thought that looks really, really interesting. So maybe someday I wanna study that. And then I realized that I could take a full semester of Japanese or excuse me, a full quarter of Japanese during summer school. So I took five hours a day, five days a week for 10 weeks and I got through Japanese one, two and three and then I was back on track. So I added Japanese to my communications major and then uh, had a double major for my time at UCSB. But what I wanted to share with you was just sort of, you know, that had nothing to do with my plan. And a lot of times when we have these kind of alumni career series and conversations, it looks like when you reach my point in my or the point that I'm at in my career, it looks like someone just took this easy road up and to the right. And life just isn't like that. And this, you know, my very first uh, experience at UCSB where I ended up majoring in Japanese without ever meaning to, that all happened by uh, accident. Uh, some of the most important things in life happen that way. They're called black swan events. And if you don't know what that means, there's something that's totally unpredictable and comes completely out of the blue. And the most major things that I've happened, had happened in life have come that way. So uh, the, the lesson here, I think the takeaway is don't worry too much, follow your heart, do the best that you can but life's going to present you with things. And then you just have to decide where you take it from there because there will be bumps and scrapes along the way, guaranteed. Um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about work, some just things that I've learned over the years that I thought might be helpful to you. So this talk today will be a little bit about high level strategy and um, sort of 30,000 level view, and then also getting down into tactical things that I wish I had known when I was just starting out in my career. And so the first thing that I wanted to share with you was when you find a job, and we can talk later about job strategies and searching for jobs and how you get interviews and all of those things, but when you find that job that you're really starting your career in, in the first 30 days, go out and meet with as many people as you can and ask them 
specifically, what advice do you have for me? And they will give you their feedback and that will be invaluable as you're sort of making your way through this new company. And then what you want to do is you want to ask them as well, okay, who are two more people that I should speak with? And they will give you a couple of names and then you can go out and speak with those folks. And then you just repeat the process. And that way you get to low, get to know a lot of people very early on in your career and in your job. And what you'll find is certain names continue to pop up over time. And those are the folks within the organization that really have influence and hold sway. And you want to make note of that because those are the people who's, who will be influencing at the top and how things go within that company. Um, and then the, the third thing that I would say is just, you know, sort of follow the money within any company you will see that different organizations get funded. Some do and some don't. Some companies that I've worked for, it was engineering and other places it was finance that ran the company. And what you wanna think about is uh, marketing or and or communications in particular, just a little dose of reality, but it, we're considered overhead. So there's only one organization that brings in any funding to a company and that's sales. So when you're in sales, if you're in sales, it's a pretty safe place to be in terms of longevity, if you're in any other function, you can be considered overhead because they have to pay out to pay you. You're not bringing money into the company. So when that happens, you know, you want to be cognizant of which organizations have the funding. So if you find out a particular product organization is getting funding or they're getting their research or their projects funded, you might look into partnering with that organization or even potentially moving into that organization. So one way of finding out where the power resides within a company is to follow the money and see who's getting funded and what they're actually able to do. Okay, the second piece of advice I have for you is um, around learning the business. So a lot of um, times in marketing and or communications functions, in my experience, I would run into folks who would say, you know, it's just, it's boring. I'm not really that interested in it. But if you take the time to learn the business, particularly if you listen in on the quarterly earnings calls, what you're going to hear, you'll hear directly from the CEO if you're in a public company. And that CEO is going to outline what the strategy is, what's going well, and what's not going so well. So even if you can't sit through all of the financials on those quarterly earnings call, just sit through the first 10 minutes of the CEO. He's going to give you, or she, the update as to how the business is doing. Um, and what you can do then is if you understand the business, that gives you the language of the company. So you can now have a conversation with anyone in the company across the board, whether they're in engineering or operations or HR, you can always come back to how that company is doing because that's the baseline. That's something that you've got in common with everyone within the company. So it really serves you well if you understand how that company is doing in terms of business overall. Um, and the other thing that, um, you know, it'll give you the strategy going forward for the business. So, for example, if if you hear on the call, we're going to be investing in Latin America, you know now where that, per my previous comment, where the funding's going to go and where the emphasis is going to be for that company coming up. So you can really sort of make strategic decisions about your career and where you want to move if you understand what the company's priorities are. The third thing that I wanted to share with you on a very tactical level, and this is something that I do to this day, is early in my career, I worked um, for a, a manager who told me that the intern within the organization was the best person at managing up that he had ever met. And so I asked him specifically what that meant, because you often hear manage up, it's important, manage up. And what he told me was that he kept a prioritized list of all the projects that he was working on and would go over those projects with his manager every time they had a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So you'll have a one-on-one -on -one meeting probably on a weekly basis if you get into a corporate job with your manager. And what happens is as people are worried about their day-to-day -day life, they're managing, they've got you to manage along with three or four or five or 10 other people, they're managing up to their boss, they may be throwing things over the wall, so to speak, to you. So they might say on a Monday, I really need you to focus on orange. And then on a Wednesday, they'll say, oh, you need to be focusing on yellow. And then on a Friday, they'll come back and say, focus on green, having forgotten that they told you to focus on those other colors earlier in the week. 
And now suddenly you're just in catcher mode trying to receive all of this information coming from your manager and figuring out, okay, what do I prioritize off? So, so now you stop doing orange and yellow because green was the most re recent thing you've been told to focus on. And the next week they come back and say, well, how are you doing on orange? And you think, well, wait a minute, hold on. I just, you told me green. So keeping a list like this, what I'm showing here with you on the screen, this is what I go over with my manager every week. And I say, okay, this is priority number one. This is priority two. And these are priority number three. Is this still the priority that you want me to have? And so we go over line by line what I'm working on. And then if they have a different priority order, then we rearrange things and I know where I, I need to refocus my efforts. But this really helps keep things on track with your manager so that they're, they know exactly what you're working on and that you're prioritizing the things that they want you to be prioritizing. Okay, the third thing I was going to talk to you about tonight is marketing, because I got the feedback that marketing might be something you would be interested in. And over my career, I've held multiple different marketing and communications roles. So I've done product marketing, marketing communications, marketing strategy, demand generation, event marketing, executive communications, PR. So I thought I'd go just a little bit into some basics around marketing, some things to keep in mind if if that's the direction you want to go with your career, if you're interested in marketing. So the first story, the first uh, slide I have here is the story about um, there's a company called Cisco Systems. They've been around for about 30 years now. But back in the day when they were founded, they were founded at Stanford University. And um, Len Bozak worked in one department at Stanford and his wife, Sandy Lerner, worked in a different department at Stanford. And they needed a way to communicate back and forth with one another during the day to find out if the other person had fed the cats or not. And so they literally invented the router because they had computer systems at the time, but their computer systems, they were in different departments. And so the computers didn't talk to one another. And the router became that piece of machinery between the two different systems that allowed them to talk. And so um, this founding story is something that became very famous for Cisco. And it became really fundamental around how they saw themselves. And this founding story or brand story becomes the strategic narrative and the foundation for really all of the marketing efforts that any company is going to do. Because if you've got a firm foundation, and I'll show you in a minute the structure of a marketing strategy, then your house stands up well. If it doesn't, like with anything, if you don't have a firm foundation, then it falls over. And so Cisco, their brand became about day-to-day, -day, sort of how do we facilitate communications for people across the world who just need to be able to have a conversation with one another. And the whole company sort of really reflected that brand. We were very frugal. Um, it was uh, sort of very hardworking. And um, that founding of the story, that founding story permeated everything that we did. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the strategic narrative, because if you talk with anyone during an interview or around a marketing role and you say, look, you know, everything needs to be based on the strategic narrative, or we need to ensure that we're communicating consistently across everything that we're doing. Now you're speaking the language of marketing, because sometimes what happens is the folks within PR will issue a press release and they'll be talking about one thing or in a certain way. And then the folks who are doing an event are talking a little bit differently. And then the folks who are doing demand generation or um, SEO or you know a social media campaign might be using different words and talking in a different way. And now the brand experience of the consumer is very different depending upon what they're consuming. So what you wanna do is get that brand strategy and that strategic narrative consistent that's the foundation, and then everything can flow from there. So the strategic narrative, as I mentioned, it becomes the foundation for everything that you do, regardless of what marketing channel you're using. And so this here is something that we call the stone tablets. This is uh, something we created while I was at Xilinx. That was the company that Wendy mentioned earlier. But uh, this really was based on the strategic narrative. You'll see the foundation is at the top, which is not where a foundation typically goes, but that's where it is in this particular model. And so once you have that strategic narrative at the top, then your key messages flow from that strategic narrative and go down into each of the different types of marketing materials you're creating. So for example, if you're creating a product, you've got product A, you create a story around that product and that messaging flows down to the proof points. Proof points are things like 
the data points about the product. If it's, it, let's say it's a computer product, then it's how fast it works, or it's the data that you use to prove that it does what it says it's going to do. And then maybe industry benchmarks, it's faster than a benchmark, something like that. Case studies, these are your customers who are using them and how they're using your product. And then down here, your customer testimonials. And so the point here, what we're trying to say is that all of these should sound like they're coming from the same company and they should be have they should have the same marketing message across them. And then that is true. So whether your let's say your customer your customer testimonial goes out through um, an integrated campaign at the bottom, no matter what channel you're using, these are all the tactical channels, whether it's an event or an employee and executive communications, all of this works together consistently to tell the same story. And then I wanted to share with you what a, stramp, a sample strategic narrative looked like. So this is what we created at Xilinx. And so it says, at Xilinx, we believe in you, the innovators, the change agents, and builders who are developing the next breakthrough idea. Xilinx is a platform on which your inventions become real. We will get you to market faster, help you stay competitive in an ever-changing world, and keep you at the forefront of your industry. So we were really trying to talk to these people here, the innovators and the change agents. Oops, I just clicked it. Okay. Um, are you seeing double now, Wendy? No, okay, good. All right. Um, and so these the innovators and the change agents are the build and the builders are that's who we wanted to speak to. So that's why we called them out specifically. And then we tell them exactly what we're going to do for them, get you to market faster. So Xilinx was a semiconductor company, is a semiconductor company. Um, and that's how we positioned the narrative for that company. Okay, my practical advice for you is to tell stories as you can. Stories resonate with people and they're very memorable. So if you can tell your story as an individual, particularly on places like LinkedIn, so you may feel that you don't have information to share yet or it's still earlier in your career, you still have stories to tell. Stories about classes that you've taken or experiences that you've had. Those are the thing that, things that make you memorable. And what you can do on something like LinkedIn then is as you're applying for roles, people will look you up on LinkedIn and they'll see your recent posts and they'll know what you have to talk about. Um, as I mentioned earlier, life is not up and to the right. So just know that there are a lot of setbacks that are, will happen along the way. I left corporate life three different times. I did a startup. I stayed home with my kids. I went back to graduate school and all three times I got back in. So don't feel like if you make one decision that it's forever, you can still create the life that you want, even if it's not a straight line. Uh, Black Swan events will happen. We all went through the pandemic. So that's a perfect example of that. Just out of the blue, no one was prepared for that. So just know that sometimes the best things in life come out of, I sat next to a gentleman on a flight back to Singapore and ended up going to the Kennedy School at Harvard because he did and his friends did. <laughs> so you never know what life is going to bring your way. Uh, manage up, as I mentioned, that's going to help you with your career. And then get a mentor and coach. You know, every professional basketball team, every professional athlete has a coach and they can always help you. Mentors can help you internally, externally. I know we've got a phenomenal mentor program here as well. So I, I highly encourage you to do that. But even past that during your career, coaches can be tremendously helpful. And then lastly, if you'd like to continue the conversation, uh, this is my LinkedIn, um, the QR code here. And then I do write a weekly blog that uh, you're welcome to sign up for. That goes out on Saturday mornings. And that's it. Woohoo. Thank you very much, Janelle. You're very welcome. So let's Sorry see. about that. <laughs> Thank you, Janelle. We'd like to open it up to questions now. Um, so you can either put your question in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and jump in and ask your question. Don't be shy. I have a question, Janelle. 
So if you're looking to hire someone straight out of UCSB or someone new that maybe doesn't have the technical expertise for strategic marketing, what are some of the other skill sets that they can highlight for you? If they want to come into, they want to get into a marketing career. Exactly. Um, so the very first thing I would say um, is get in the door whatever way you can if if you're interested you can always move into marketing or move into a different role but if there's anything at a company you're interested in that you find that matches your skill set go for it if you can um but the second thing i would say is that you you can market yourself and your skills and show your marketing expertise that way so in other words, if you read the job description and you understand the job description says, we need you to be able to do A, B, and C, how can you tell stories and give proof points around how you can meet A, B, and C from that job description? So um, you can market yourself. And that's why I think the LinkedIn is really good for you to help with your personal brand. And then also, um, you know, it's so tough now, particularly with AI, to get your resume past the scanners, right? It's mm -hmm. very, very difficult. So to the degree that you can reach out to people and say, and just tell them who you are and what you're interested in. Hey, I'm interested in your company. I'm new. I'm right out of school. Um, I've got A, B, and C qualities. Would you be willing just to have an informational interview with me? It's a great way to start building those connections. Doesn't cost you anything. And then once you got those, if there's a rapport built there, and then you can say at the end of the interview, you know, would you be comfortable introducing me to someone else? Or can I reach out to you again? Can I follow up? The thing is, it's just don't be shy. It's really, mm -hmm. that's the hard part. But if you put yourself out there, that's how you can find maybe things that might not be exactly particular in your wheelhouse. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we did get a question from Grace um, Kansik, and it's a great question. Um, I'll go ahead and read it. How can I get a mentor or a coach? So first, I'd like to have someone on the council jump in and answer this question regarding our own mentor program, and then we can talk. We can turn the question over to Janelle um, for her professional advice on that. David, do you want to, um, or Jennifer? Um, Hello. Oh, there he is. Um, so the uh, the Calm Alumni Council has a uh, mentoring program that undergrads can sign up for and get paired up uh, with an alumni mentor. And uh, I think we'll need to, uh, I don't know if we can send out that link or gather everybody's email that's on here. Uh, I, we should probably have that in the registration, I anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Okay. So we can, if we can send out that link, uh, to, we'll send, send out that link to everybody. If you're not signed up, uh, we'll, uh, we'll send that link and you can sign yourself up for it. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Um, Jan Janelle, do you have any advice for getting a mentor or a coach within the organization? Yeah, absolutely. So I have one now. I have a mentor. And uh, a couple months after I was in the job, so I have a I have a full-time job and then I have Grayson Hayden Group. I um, You sort of want to get the lay of the land and figure out, again, it's like any kind of network, right? Companies are made of people and some people hold more sway and more influence than others. And so I identified someone that I thought was an influential and powerful person at the top of the organization and reached out to her. And I said, would you be willing to mentor me? And she said, yes, hundred mm -hmm. percent. And that was it. She's been my mentor ever since. And so she is kind of a my confidant, you know, if I hear rumors or something's going on in the company, I can call her up and or send her a message and say, what's going on? Have you heard about this? Um, and she also lets me know where the pitfalls are. You know, she lets me know how I show up in meetings. She lets me know things that are coming down that I should be aware of. So if you can get someone maybe that is just a little bit higher than you are in the, uh, the view will be a little bit different and that will be helpful to you. On That's that, cool. on that point, Janelle, what what makes a good mentee? Because I assume your mentor doesn't do all of the work, <laughs> but you yeah. do a lot of the work too. So what makes a good mentee from your viewpoint? So I um, I ask for her feedback 
And I ask her how I show up and where I need to focus. And that is very helpful to her because to your point, she's super busy. She's got a lot going on. And so if I want something out of the relationship, then I've got to ask for it. Um, but I also try and, and reciprocate by being very supportive of what she's doing and looking out for her best interests as I can within the organization. And I will alert her to things if I hear of things or send things her way um, if I can do that. So it becomes kind of a, a sort of reciprocal relationship. Now, we have put the link in the chat. Um, so we encourage everyone to go ahead and click the link and take a look at that. Um, Janelle, do you have any other advice though, if you're um, not participating in the Calm Council Mentor Program and you're not with an organization, where can a person who's graduated from UCSB find a mentor if they're still looking for a job? If they're still looking for a job. So the mentors, that so the UCSB Comms Council and the ones internally are great because they're free. Mm -hmm. um, it gets a little bit trickier if you move out of uh, associations that you're affiliated with, because a lot of times mentors or coaches, they charge for their services. So there may be other organizations that offer uh, mentoring. I don't know of them offhand. I'd have to do a little bit of research and come back to you. Um, but if you can do it within organizations that you have a relationship with, that's usually the best way to go. Mm -hmm. I've actually had people reach out to me um, through LinkedIn. They uh -huh. were acquainted with my family or people I work with or were recommended to me. And so I don't, I think that that would be if you're bold enough to actually use the network, use like the LinkedIn, uh, your network um, without, you know, abusing people, you know, oh, just trying to use them for some advice, but to try to actually develop relationships. Yeah. LinkedIn is such an important tool. So if any of you have not um, created a LinkedIn profile, and we really should. Yeah, I think Ron has a question. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to point out uh, something else. I'm uh, tremendously impressed by your experience and uh, wisdom, uh, Janelle. But I want, for those students who don't already recognize this, I want people to understand that the position you're taking, that you are seeking feedback and critique, that as you said, I want this person to tell me how I'm doing in a meeting so I can learn and how I can improve. It's very similar actually to an academic job, which is we get evaluated all the time. After a while, we get not only used to that, we realize it's a bonus. It's, it's a generous thing to seek out and receive critique from other people because most positions and most people insulate themselves. They defend themselves. They want to maintain their image and identity. And so they can't improve and they can't learn. So I think underneath your... Um, you know, very uh, comfortable kind of advice is a very, very deep uh, personal and philosophical um, perspective to take that is very difficult for people to to become uh, comfortable with. Yeah, it is, that's right. It is difficult to say, you know, because it's painful. It can be very painful to hear that feedback. But to your point, I, I can't, I'm not going to see those weaknesses or get better unless I am brave enough to ask. Yeah. Wendy, I think you're... <laughs> Why do we still do that? Okay. Um, if you were looking back at your years at UCSB um, as a communication studies major, um, was there a particular course or um, a professor that maybe influenced you the most in deciding where to start off in your career? Uh, there was a course that I took around intercultural communication, and I can't tell you who the professor was now, I'm sorry to say, um, but I that really resonated with me because so much of communication is, is listening and then learning how to pick up on <clears throat> different cues and what's, what is being said as well as what is not being said, and that, that differs tremendously from culture to culture. And so I really appreciated that, um, especially because I was studying Japanese at the same time. But then it taught me not to, we make certain assumptions in our culture about how things work. And it taught me not to make certain, I mean, from the smallest things like 
the addresses on our houses tend to go up in order. And in other countries, they don't necessarily, you know, if you're, it's one order on one block, it might be completely different numbers on the next block. And um, just small things like that, I think, made it really interesting to understand that people perceive and understand the world very differently than we do. And so I, I took a lot from that course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Leslie shared a link. Leslie, do you want to talk about this um, resource for our our students? Sorry, I became very busy in sharing a lot of links when I heard that we didn't have the comm mentoring program up. So I shared that, and it's definitely time to sign up for all the students. And then I also shared about Gaucho Network. Is that the one that you're speaking about, Wendy? And the LinkedIn uh, Calm Council. Uh, calm, yes, uh, yes. So we have within our Calm department, we have a LinkedIn group. And we include in that group anyone who's affiliated with the department. So that can be alumni, it can be students, it can be professors. And this is a, a fabulous opportunity to post information like Janelle is speaking right now. We would post that there and also for people to make connections. So we encourage people who are, I had someone today and she's wanting an internship in New York. And I said, well, make a post in our LinkedIn group saying, I'm a third year, I'm looking for an internship in New York, Who, who is there that could give me a hand. And then also after you make the big post go, to go back and to see who actually is living in New York and send them a message asking them, Gaucho Calm student to alumni, if they'd be willing to hop on a coffee date with you. So that's a great opportunity um, for all of you who are students, you wanna go to the website that Professor Rice maintains. And in that we list all of the members of our Calm Council and what many things keep us connected with one another on the Calm Council to include the fact that we are very open to hearing from students or alumni who are looking to make a change. We, that's part of our unstated mission statement that we are happy to help people. So that's that LinkedIn group. When you apply for that, make sure that you have, that you are a Calm student and when you intend to graduate so that when we take a look at that, it makes it easier. We have invitations from people all the time who aren't gauchos, who are in differing majors, and we specifically say this is just for those within our department. So make sure you do that, that's helpful. And then with Gaucho Network, that's also a tremendous resource. And all of these are free for you. All you have to do is register. With Gaucho Network, you also have to be approved. So give yourself a little bit of time, but it gives you an opportunity to many different gauchos from many different majors, grad years, locations, who you can again connect with playing the gaucho to gaucho card. Does it does that answer it, Wendy? It does. I I do think we also post job announcements in Gaucho Network, correct? We do that in Gaucho Network and we do it also in our Department of Calm LinkedIn group. And we encourage people who have openings in their companies. And we also encourage students who are looking to make connections in certain industries, roles, companies to reach out. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Can I just hop in just for a second again to the students? Mm -hmm. You may not realize this. No other department on UCSB campus offers this. This alumni council yeah. and these resources and these links and this direct support, you are extremely fortunate. And these people, I mean, just listen to them, the wonderful, wonderful people. So take advantage. Don't just say, oh, that's cool. You have an yeah. incredible advantage and these are these are wonderful opportunities. Yeah, everyone on campus looks at the Department of Communication Alumni Council and says, oh, we should do that. Well, they should. It would be very helpful. Um, I would love to hear from the students how, you know, if you've come to these virtual career series before and and 
and please use this opportunity to make connections, to reach out to the different alumni and to reach out to the different students who are on this and send them a LinkedIn invitation. So I've written a list of everybody who's attended and I'll reach out to all of you I can find on LinkedIn and I'll share the different ways, the different programs we have within our alumni council to help make it easier for you. But the connections you're making in your classrooms will take you through the rest of your life and you want to tap into it. That's part of the investment you're making. Patrick, do you have a question? Hmm. Okay. So I do want to mention that we will have our next um, career series speaker on December 13th. I don't happen to have the list with me. Megan, do you have the list? I don't have it on me. Okay. It's somewhere. Okay. But I do have, I have one more question for Janelle. Okay. Um, so Janelle, in terms of, are you a part of any sort of like industry groups or associations that maybe have like young professional membership or student membership or know of any that might be good if somebody wants to get started in this industry? Yeah. The IABC, do you know the IABC, the International I Association of Business Communicators? So okay. Yeah, they have a they have a great group and they have great resources around communications. I can't tell you exactly what uh, I believe they have a student discount, um, but that is a wonderful association around um, people who work in marketing or PR or any sort of communications function within companies uh, that I found that was that was really good. There's also um, some really good networking and classes that can be done through um, Harvard, both Harvard and Stanford uh, allow some online. And I have taken some online classes uh, with them around communications uh, and in particular, and ended up networking with and having some really great relationships with people that have come out of that and have led to something. And those, those are open to anyone. Those are sort of like, you know, either free or uh, executive education type of resources. So I, I highly recommend those because when you get into breakout groups and those, and if it's around a topic that you're interested in, then you end up meeting other people who are interested in the same thing and you can form networks that way. That's great. Um, I do hey. have, oh, uh, I do have information about our December speaker on December 13th, we will have, um, Com alumni Jordan Gomez, who is a first vice president at Kidder Matthews, and he'll be talking about investment sales. So tune in on December 13th. And again, um, well, I don't know if I mentioned, um, we do record all of our sessions, including tonight. And uh, Professor Rice maintains all of these recordings, um, uploads them, edits them, and puts them on YouTube. So, um, and they're available on that same link I sent out before that lists the um, the presenters. It's all on the same page, and we have every video that's ever been performed. An unbelievable amount of wisdom, and several cat photos. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Janelle, can you hear me? I can. Oh, hi, it's it's Patrick. I'm sorry if I missed uh, the first ten minutes of the call, but. Um, one thing, since you're talking about um, the power and, and the benefits of seeking a mentor and, you know, and networking in a way, perhaps could you maybe expound upon what that there's that maxim that I think all of us have, have heard and some of us subscribe to it more. But really, it's the the ability. It's not really who you, it's not really what you know, but who, you know, which, you know, proves itself, I think, true over and over. And it's probably maybe more important for the students when they're coming out trying to get that first job. And maybe you could, can you maybe expound upon that? Because I think if someone would have maybe told that to me earlier, I would have been more receptive to the messaging that you're giving now. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, he's exactly, Patrick, exactly right. So I don't know if you've heard the saying that um, the five people you spend the most time with is the ones that you'll end up like. And so you want to be cognizant of the kind of 
groups that you're running in because those are the the folks that you will end up, you know, if your folks are eating maybe Thai food, you'll end up eating Thai food along with them. Um, and so if you are associating with folks that have um, maybe a little bit more influence or, or a little bit more power within an organization or even just in life, find people that you have something that you want whether it's the way they uh, communicate with other people or the way they live their lives or the values that they have and um, try and see if you can create a mentoring relationship with them. It's So there's mentorship and then there's sponsorship as well. And sponsorship is really key. Also, if you let your mentor know, they can do both. But essentially what a sponsor does is they have a seat. Your mentor has a seat at the table. So you want to choose your mentor wisely, someone who is influential within the organization you're in. And they have a seat at the table where the decisions are being made. And you want to let them know, keep me in mind when those discussions are being had, because you won't be in the room for those discussions. I'm not in the room for a lot of the discussions. At my particular company, what happens is um, all of the people that are one level above me get together and they discuss everybody who is at my level. And they decide, should we give her a better rating or a lower rating? Is she growth opportunity? You know, is she growth material? And that's what happens in a lot of companies. And so if you have a strong voice in that room that is influential and can advocate for you and say, I know this person well, they're leaning in, they're actually asking for more responsibility, they're um, curious and engaged, they're ambitious, we need to give them a shot. That's going to go a long way for you helping you achieve your goals and accomplish your goals. So yeah, thank you, Patrick, for bringing that up. I think that's a, that's a really important point. It is about who you know. And in fact, I have to say, I think that coming out of UC Santa Barbara, I, I worked at Cisco and um, moved into a role where I got to do communications for the former CEO. And um, he was the one that I asked to write my recommendation for graduate school. And I really believe in my heart that he's the reason that I got in to graduate school. So um, yeah, it is about who you know. <laughs> there is truth in that. Can I, can I add a little bit there? Because I'm still yes, experiencing that in, in my career as a VP. Um, because that phrase always intimidated me. I'm an introvert. Um, I'm, I'm shy. I don't like talking to people, um, which I know Ron's shaking his head. I'm, I'm doing my best to overcome. Um, but one of the ways that... Um, basically that you can have someone in a room advocating for you is just to really safeguard your reputation at work. Um, you know, you, you put in the work, you do what you can, you offer to help. Um, my, my first year at my current job, my main goal wasn't really technical wise. You know, once I figured out I could do the job, it was to make sure that people wanted to work with me. Um, and then within that year, I had managing directors coming to me directly asking for help with comms. Um, and, and so it's not necessarily about who you know now, um, but it's it's about, um, you know, kind of just getting getting your reputation through your work. Yeah, I think that's right. I think, Jennifer, you got to you have to put in the work. You've got to have it. I will say also, I think that. I wrote a blog post called Visibility Eats Diligence for Lunch because you can have diligence, but you can't have just diligence. You have to have it with visibility because I think we've all been in positions where you've seen someone who has the visibility but hasn't put in the hard work and yet they seem to be rising to the top and you're thinking, how is that happening? I've worked so much harder or so-and-so works so much harder and deserves the opportunity. How come they're not rising to the top? So I, I, even if you're an introvert, if you can take those visibility opportunities where you can build on the reputation, you've got to do the hard work, like Jennifer said, but can you present at a staff meeting? Can you present at some kind of cross-functional meeting? Is there an opportunity? Can you put your hand up and say, I'd like to represent the work that we're doing? Creating those visibility opportunities or going for them really helps you to get known wider in addition to... Uh, I think the the hard work. I've just seen a lot of people who worked really, really hard and were very deserving not get what they deserved without the visibility.
a good lesson, Janelle. Thank you. How did you yeah. do it, Jennifer, as an introvert, if I can ask? You made it to VP. <laughs> I I, uh, I made it to VP in four years. Wow. Um, mainly by by figuring out ways to say yes. Um, you know, the, the requests that people come up with, the ideas they have in their head don't always work. Um, but I, I, um, you know, found creative solutions that would work for them or told them, Hey, I think that this would reach your goals better, you know, by asking those pointed questions on what they really wanted to achieve. Um, and, and it became where people started coming to me instead of my boss, like they would wow. just come to me directly. Uh, and so then my name just got included, you know, to your point about visibility, my name got out there more. I didn't, I didn't have to go out and say, um, you know, Hey, look, look at me, look at the work I'm doing. I, you know, I kind of let it speak for itself a little bit, but my name got out there because I was the problem solver. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, even now, you know, I, I, um, I work for our chief marketing officer and she's still out there, you know, if, if another chief comes to her and asks for something, she's just like, cool, I'm looping in Jen, we're going to tag team this, you know, she, she's still making it a point to, to make sure they know, yeah, Jen's on this too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Do we have any other questions or anyone want to share? their own experience in the professional workplace. All right, well then um, we will see you all next month on December 13th at six o'clock for our next career series. And within a few days, you can find this recording on YouTube. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us.